He, he used to always say things that would be slightly offensive because he just speaks whatever's on his mind. Like we, I don't know the number of times it's been like, Alex, if you like that girl, you can't say that. <laughs>
needed to have enough information to be able to execute the filming. So, yeah, that's it. Yes. Um, so, uh, I think, I don't know if you're here. Did we have a plan to ask uh, Val, essentially, for the film? Uh, so those are the questions that we really had to kind of ask ourselves before we even committed to making the film. We had to kind of go over all potential outcomes and, you know, have a plan. And, and you know, you, you can't go into a film like this and not have thought really carefully about it. And just try to react in the moment because you never be able to make a good decision. It would be really terrible. But you know, we always knew that like the reason we were making this film is because of Alice's story and Alice's legacy and who he is as a person and this dream he had and he was you know this character who was you know really this highly intelligent but shy, awkward, scared kid that you know, was willing to face his fears meticulously, one by one, and kind of like work through it. Uh, and that kind of trajectory for the narrative to us was really interesting and really inspiring. You know, I mean, here he goes from this awkward shy kid who becomes like a superhero, essentially. Uh, and so I think that, you know, we thought that if he fell, and I know this sounds really kind of morbid, and, Maybe it's hard to wrap your head around, but I mean, really, the film wouldn't have been that different in the sense of what we were saying. You know, it was about you know someone who had the courage to face his fears constantly, and you know, step by step, you know, move through his fear. Whether that was you know seeing the people hugged and being like, well, hugging looks like it's terrifying to me because I'm. Emotionally inept and like intimacy is like totally terrifying to me. But I'm going to force myself to teach myself how to hug. And I was part of that process. I've known him for like 12 years. And when I first met him, he gave the worst hugs in the world. He wouldn't touch your chest, and then you'd feel his hand in the middle of your back. And you'd like, tap the middle of your back. And you'd be like, dude, that's not really a hug. So I've been there with him through a lot of it too, which has been fun. Yeah. It's been a couple of years or so. Is he good or is he already thinking I'm gonna go back and do it again faster, looking for the next part? Yeah, is Alex good or is he thinking about other things? Well, fortunately climbing has a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different expressions. And Alex is the t so he's he really you know, he's a mensatested genius, meaning you know, his IQ is through the roof. And he also has this kind of intelligence about him where he was like, okay, I can't think about app, like free soloing all cap as the pinnacle of my career because it puts too much pressure on it. And so what I'm gonna think about are all of these other projects that I wanna do, not all free soloing, uh, but, you know, so right after he free soloed all cap, he went to Alaska on an expedition, then we went to Antarctica on an expedition, and then last spring, or maybe the spring before, he went and broke a speed record on the nose. So he already planned all these other things so that there was a continuum of things to do. Uh, and there's all kinds of other climbing objectives that he wants to do, but I don't think, you know, I think he's called it good on big, scary free souls, because really, after El Cap, there really isn't much left to do. So. Yeah. What's your favorite part of the movie? What's, What's my favorite part of the movie? I love questions <laughs> from uh, kids because they always cut straight to the <laughs> <laughs> uh, My favorite parts are I have some favorite shots. Uh, the traverse ditch at the top. Like, there's different parts for me that are favorites. Like, there's parts that I, I love because of like the technical shooting aspect of it, and so like the traverse pitch on, uh, on the final day were really hard to get, and, and we nailed them exactly like we wanted to, but of course, the boulder bomb shot, like when he finishes the karate kick, 
because yeah, those were remote trigger, trigger cameras, so we didn't know if we had gotten it. <laughs> and so when we finally got everything like ingested with our digital tag, we finally got to sit down and look at it, and we watched the footage of him doing the boulder problem, which we'd been imagining for three years. And then we were like, we got it in the can, and then that mid moment when he turns over and he looks at the camera and he's like, yeah. Like, I <laughs> fell out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah! <laughs> it was amazing. Um, but the other parts of the film that I really love, and I think that really gives the film like the emotional depth and the narrative, like a strong narrative, is those moments in the van where Alex and Sonny are having like those really difficult conversations. And that verite filming, you know, filming the moment where nothing's constructed, you're just there. I mean, that's really hard to get those, those kind of critical moments. And there's that scene when Alex is going to solo, he's kind of, you know, fuddling around with his stuff in the drawer. The camera's kind of panning back from him to Sonny, and she's like, who are you climbing with tomorrow? And you as an audience, no, he's going, and Sonny doesn't. I think those moments are like really priceless to me. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I, uh, I saw Miro and enjoyed that immensely. I enjoyed this immensely, and not to bang on words. But any thoughts or comments on similarities and differences between Miro and this from the Yes. Uh, so he's commenting about Miro, which is a previous film that uh, I made mean, with. Much high, and um, if there was any similarities or differences in the Mies, uh, in the making of these two films. Actually, I'm just out of curiosity, how many people have seen Meru? Oh, that's pretty good. Um, how many people have actually already seen Free Solo? That's pretty good, too. So, the big difference between Meru and this film is that I had kind of shot Meru uh, with my friend Renan, and we were kind of just shooting parts of our lives, and we weren't really thinking about making a feature documentary. And then we kind of went back and pieced it together, went back and reshot all these interviews, and, and built that film. And that narrative is, you know, if you've seen the film, it's, it's very Shakespearean, you know, it's, like, it's got some plot twists, and it's just. Um, and it's very close to my heart because it's about my mentor, Conrad Anger. But this film, we went in with very clear intentions of what kind of film we wanted to make. You know, we knew that we wanted to make a really strong cinema verite film, meaning like film in the moment. Um, and really, a cinema verite filming is, I think, the most difficult because you just have to spend so much time filming. You just have to be there. You never know. You know, when a moment's gonna happen, so you're kind of constantly filming, and it's it's a it's a long, arduous process, but it does provide these very real moments, which brings you into the film. You know, that's that's when you kind of really experience it, and you're along for the ride, and you have a good period of film. But um, so that's kind of, kind of the main difference. You know, we we knew what kind of film we wanted. I had a lot of plans and like how I wanted to shoot it in a way that was really pushing the kind of cinematography that I've been doing for 20 years and you know, take it as far as I possibly could. And so I had some time to really think about how I wanted to do it and then we were able to execute it. So that's the main difference. Yeah, and then the very far back corner. Yeah, that's a fair question. What, what really inspired me to do Free Solo? Well, one of the things clearly is that Alex is an extraordinary athlete. Like, even among his peer group, like, Alex's peer group of world class climbers and athletes, I mean, they're all kind of anomalies. Like, they're, they, there's something special about them that makes them singular. And even among his peer group of anomalies, he's like an anomaly among a peer group of anomalies. Like even the best climbers in the world are like, Alex is on uh, this other plane that nobody quite understands. Um, and that's because his mental capacity to 
manage fear and to just be able to compartmentalize fear and execute perfectly when the stakes are, you know, life and death, but also just, I mean, there's no hiding from what the stakes are. You know, you're 2,000 feet up the deck and you're standing on dime edges and you're holding on to nothing. I mean, the fact that somebody can, you know, perform flawlessly in those situations you know, is, is amazing. And I mean, we've had all kinds of world-class athletes reach out about it. Tom Brady, like, you know, where they're just like, they appreciate it because, you know, the greatest athletes in the world are always judged by how well they perform when the stakes are the highest, right? So I think when, when other athletes see what he does, they get it. They're like, that is extraordinary. So that's one side of it. And the other side is what I was talking about, you know, the fact that you know, the reason Alex started free soloing was because it was less scary for him to go climbing up these cliffs without a rope, which is really, really scary, um, than it was for him to talk to someone and ask them to be his climbing partner because he was so shy and so terrified of talking to people. And that story always struck, you know, this very human um, chord with us where, we're, you know, I think everybody knows what that fear feels like uh, and then to be able to kind of transcend all of that and become the world's greatest free soloist is, is a story that we found really inspiring. Mm. Yeah. Is there any plan to release the footage of the entire three hours, 56 minutes? Because I'd, I'd love to watch yeah. that. <laughs> You're not the first person that asked that, but the question is, are, is there any plan to release the three hours and 56 minutes of him climbing? Uh, there isn't, but like, I mean, every week, <laughs> There's been so many people that have asked, we're like, hmm, maybe we should be releasing that. I don't know. Um, I think it would be boring. I mean, most of the best angles that we shot, you have seen. Because we literally, over the course of two years, shot with him practicing on the climb. And we were like dialing exactly how we're going to shoot all the kind of critical pitches that were important to the narrative. So, like the free blast, the boulder pitch. The Enduro Corner, um, those are really important to the story. But it's a 3,000 foot wall, we couldn't put 60 cameras on it. So the, there's only one, there's only two cameras that were shooting the entirety of it, and those are on the ground. Um, so it's, you can see them climbing, but uh, it's not as interesting as like when you know, you're top down and you can see 2,000 feet of this still How much time do we have? Okay, a couple more? Yes. How many times a week do you hit the gym? How many times a week do I hit the gym? I, ne I used to never hit the gym because I used to just go climbing and skiing, and that was funny because you spent like six to eight hours on the mountains and you just get really fit. But on the last five or six months in the tour, you know, Alex and I go to every climbing gym in every city, um, like pretty much every day or every day we're not traveling. Uh, just for our sanity. Because we're used to being outside and hanging out in Yosemite, and now we're flying between London, New York, and LA like pretty much nonstop for five months. But mm. um, so it's still fun. Uh, yes, right there, back over the glasses. Yes, you. Um, you said that Alex is very shy. Yeah. So how did he react it, and what was his motivation to film the entire crew? Mm. Yes. Yes, another very good question. Uh, so Alex has kind of evolved over time. Uh, when I first met him, he was 22. And even then, I mean, he was socially very awkward. And the, the 10 years following that, being a professional climber, um, kind of being more of a public personality, like he's had to kind of come out of his shell uh, a bit. Uh, and. I don't know how else to say it, but like, I feel like we've done a lot of training with him, where we would be like, you know, he'd say, he, he used to always say things that would be slightly offensive because he just speaks whatever's on his mind. Like we, I don't know the number of times it's been like, Alex, if you like that girl, you can't say that. <laughs> you know? And as you see, I mean, he's very blunt with uh, Sani in the film. You know, she's like, would you take me into consideration? He's like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh. <laughs> like um, but, 
But he's honest. He's very, very honest. Um, and uh, but the, the reason why he was able to have this film when he was like, okay, I'm willing to commit to this film, is just because he trusted us. And we, I spent 10 years traveling around the world, climbing with him, filming with him. Uh, we've been through a lot together. Uh, he loved Meru. And I think he, you know, when I was like, look, I think we can make a good film and an honest film about you that's not gonna be sensationalized or, you know, put on these kind of normal preconceived notions that other people from the outside of climbing always put on to climbers or adventurers, you know, oh, they're super risky. And, you know, he knew that I understood it. And he also trusted Chai, my wife, as a filmmaker. And so he basically committed uh, and said, yeah, I, let's do it. And once he commits, as you can see, he commits fully. And so, you know, when we were in the car with him and he's having these like very uncomfortable, intimate conversations with his girlfriend, you know, his rationale, and I'm only saying this because I've heard him answer this question, was that I trust Jimmy and Chai, if they feel like they need to be here, they're the filmmakers, I'm just gonna do whatever I'm doing. And if they say they need to be here to film it, then they need to be here to film it because they're professionals, you know? And that's kind of why he kind of let us in. But we definitely had access because he trusted us and we had like a very good relationship. Um, one more. Okay, here. So the question is, is, was there ever any like moments that we, people could relax? Uh, there are definitely sections of the route that are really easy for him, that I feel really secure, and there's good handles. I mean, for any other climber um, that's on a cap, they're really hard, but Alex, I mean, there's, there's sections in the film when you just watch him climbing and it looks like he's just swimming up the climb, a little crack. Like, if you put a normal climber that climbs in Yosemite on those pitches, you'd be like, oh, that person looks like they're really struggling, you know? <laughs> and he's just like, <laughs> he's a machine, you know? He's such a strong climber. Obviously, he trained two years to do it. Um, so there are sections where we felt like uh, he's, you know, we know that he's pretty secure. The only issue is that we're also professional climbers. We also know that oftentimes you make mistakes when you get into casual terrain. Like a lot of big accidents or fatal catastrophic accidents happen after you finish a climb and you're coming off of the mountain or you're right outside of base camp and then you fall into a crevasse and die. Or like, you know, there's, a, there's so many stories and cases where you personally experienced, where you've let your guard down because you're like, oh, this, I'm in easy terrain now, and then something bad goes ha happens. So there's always tension, but I mean, clearly the, the big sections that we were really worried about was the free blast mainly and the boulder problem. And also for the high angle team, like we're hanging up on the wall up high, so we can't really see what's happening down below. We're just getting radio updates from Mikey the guy who, the cinematographer who can't watch what he's filming. Um, you know, the, the most terrifying job was Mikey's job. Because he had to sit there and watch the entire thing, and he had to keep moving the lens, you know, so he had to keep watching, except for when he wasn't. Um, and we keep joking, like, this film's going to be great for his career, or it's going to be terrible for his career, because he's not watching what he's doing. Uh, Anyways, uh, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you again so much for coming out.